Welcome to A Space to Speak Your Mind, a radio program and a podcast about mental health and well-being made by people with lived experience in association with Cornwall Mind. We do occasionally cover subjects that some listeners may find distressing. For more information, help and support, please visit cornwallmind.org. A Space to Speak Your Mind with Cornwall Mind for better mental health. I'm Richard and this is the April programme of A Space to Speak Your Mind. And on this month's show, Claire Sanders, the Lived Experience Coordinator for Cornwall Mind, will be giving me an update on the Mental Health Transformation Project. With April being Autism Awareness Month, I'll be speaking to Mita Tarija from the Autocon Group to discuss the barriers for neurodivergent people in workplace recruitment. Rob from Cornwall Mind will be explaining how Hope Walks can support those who've lost someone to suicide. I'll be finding out about Steve's legacy, a men's mental health group that takes place at Helston Rugby Club on Wednesday afternoons. I'll speak to Alice, who's running the whole of the UK mainland coastline to raise money for Mind and the British Heart Foundation. And Joe will have the latest on what's happening at Cornwall Mind this month. That's all right here on this month's show. A space to speak your mind with Cornwall Mind. It's a space to speak your mind and I'm at Helston Rugby Club. And I'm joined by Rich, who's going to tell me about the Steve's Legacy Men's Mental Health Group that meets here every Wednesday afternoon. So good to have you here, Rich. Thank you very much. So can you just explain what Steve's Legacy is? So last year, the lady that's heading Steve's Legacy, Lee, she lost her husband last year. And she lost her husband to suicide. And he was a very good friend of mine as well. And Lee's been running a charity predominantly over the last few years that have been helping young people. So we thought we'd have a little branch off of this to help uh, men's mental health as well. So so Lee decided, well, let's see if we could do a regular talk maybe once a week to raise the awareness for men and mental health. Yeah. So this is the Sparkle Foundation, isn't it, that Lee set up? Yes, it's the Sparkle Foundation, yes. And I'm also here with Rhonda who's the wellbeing lead for the Sparkle Foundation. Tell me what the Sparkle Foundation is and how you got involved. Yes, absolutely. So I became aware of the Sparkle Foundation back in COVID, where Lee helped our family in crisis times. And then when Lee discovered about what I do for a living, we kind of put our heads together and decided to put wellbeing section part of the charity for the Sparkle Foundation. And what's your background and your history as well? So I wear a number of hats, but one of my main hats is I run a counselling service in West Cornwall in schools which have been for the last seven years called Chalk. Schools pay me for my services so I also do work with adults and everybody else as well on a private basis so that's my kind of background. So with Sparkle Wellbeing my involvement has been working with children as well, adults who have come to us in crisis so we have given them support over the years when Steve passed away, sadly, we thought it would be a lovely idea with Lee to honour Steve's legacy in supporting men's mental health. But also, I'm hoping to introduce in the next weeks or so a support group for women and for young people as well, because there's a lot of teenagers out there, adolescents that are going through lots of anxiety. The most precious part of what we're doing here, useful and valued part, is it's not just a place to come and offload and talk about problems and it's um, educational so we kind of try and help people understand where anxiety comes from and solutions because there is workable solutions for anxiety and depression and it is very very simple but it's understanding how the body works with it rich is a real expert on the human given side and i've done training in human givens as well so initially i was person-centered qualified trained but I've been training in human givens as well, which is absolutely fantastic because it works on a needs met basis, which is so important in helping the person as a whole. So how long has the group been going now? Actually, I think this is the fifth week now. So it's uh, every Wednesday and it's at uh, four o'clock and it's, uh, we do a little presentation and yeah, regular every Wednesday at Helston Rugby Club. And tell me about your background as well. Because it's quite an interesting how you got involved. So I'm ex-military and uh, I've been involved with veteran mental health for about the last 10 years. I work as a psychotherapist here in the UK and in Southern California. I work with the, the military over in the US too and I've been helping lead with the young people for the last couple of years and uh, even going into schools and uh, teaching how to manage anxiety so that's been quite nice and helpful to do. And then, and then being in Helston as well which is uh, we're near Cold Rose 
So there's a military there and there's a lot of veterans locally too. And so Lee's brought me in just to give this awareness, give some education to... It's just a guys group at, at the moment and I think we're going to expand out as well. But uh, just a, it's an education to guys for some of the simple things that they can do actually to alleviate anxiety, alleviate depression. So what kind of things do you, you do within the group? So we, we've got a little presentation, so it's a little on the TV here in the rugby club, and we'll go through um, a bit of a PowerPoint, and that ranges from talking about anxiety and how everything comes from anxiety, and then we go on to OCD, on to depression, and we cover topics like self-harming and suicidal thoughts, panic attacks, basically kind of educating the guys that want to turn up, want to come along, of some of the solutions that they can find, like a resolution to some of the issues that they're having on a day-to-day basis. It's quite interesting hearing from some of the members. They've got so much from it in just a short space of time. Yes, yeah, it's been amazing. And um, I better mention I'm a human given psychotherapist and counsellor. So we look at things from um, an angle of getting needs met. It's very important in our practice is actually getting emotional needs met, not just physical needs, but emotional needs, tying in the emotional needs and getting them met in balance and in a healthy way in people's lives really does help. And the great thing is there's many of you that are involved in the groups and especially Russ so explain about Russ's involvement. Yeah so Russ is a fantastic guy he's our clinical supervisor so he helps us and supports us with the work that we do. Russ set up the presentation has given so much useful resources for us to use within this. He came along for the first session but he's stepped back now. I think everybody here is offering so much to the group each everyone's input their experiences their sort of support their coping mechanisms and I I think just so that especially men who find it hard to communicate with each other is such a safe secure environment I'm absolutely overwhelmed and humbled and honoured to be a part of this to be able to facilitate this and to be accepted by the men as being a woman in the group as well because um, sometimes men can find it hard to have a woman involved they don't feel that they can talk but I have worked with lots of men throughout my work so I give what I can do. (laughs) Is it going to be an ongoing group are you hoping to have more people join? Yeah there's some people that are coming back every single week and they're quite enjoying it and uh, what we do we miss a few slides out because they're getting bored of the slides so we don't do the slides anymore but we also uh, we are seeing new faces every week as well which is really really nice and it's just nice for them some of the guys it feels like on week five at the moment it's a nice space for them to come to be alone to be able to talk so it's, it's different than man down which is just a talking group and I work with a lot of man down clients so a lot of referrals for man down but this is more about it's not just the talking this is about education as well and doing a presentation just to help them so that they can help themselves I think sometimes we can have anxiety or depression or PTSD but not quite know either the root cause of it or how we should go about getting help really so what you do is to sort of teach the mechanics behind why we've got these things and offer some solutions as well yeah yeah very um as a human given as therapist we're very solution based so we're looking for solutions we, we don't we don't believe in long-term therapy going on for years and we deal with a lot of trauma so i'm a trauma specialist so and working with veterans and the military and there's a lot of trauma trauma based stuff so and again this is coming from the unconscious mind so as you mentioned sometimes we don't realize what's going on that's because it's being fed by the unconscious mind and the brain is just the most amazing pattern matching machine it pattern matches to things not in just in our conscious mind but also in our unconscious mind too and if someone is listening to us right now and thinking you know what i'm having some of these things that we've just been talking about and i really would like to join the group what would your advice be well, I'd, I'd advise to come along if they can, if they, if they have the spare time. But I know it's a little bit of a, a weird time. It's, it's four o'clock in the afternoon till half past five. But I think we're going to expand a little bit as well and make it a little bit easier for some people that are working all day and they're going to finish at five o'clock. Maybe we'll do an evening session as well. But it's nice to um, to be able to give some skills and some talks because we're not taught this at school. We're not taught this as we're growing up. Coping mechanisms, uh, you know, what to do with it if you have a panic attack. And this is just a, a physiological reaction to something so breathing techniques etc we can actually um, learn those coping mechanisms learn those new skills and then if there's something deeper then we recommend you know to see a therapist if there's any trauma work because that trauma doesn't go in the human givens we use a rewind technique which is very very effective for changing the whole perception around the trauma 
in the relaxed state and in the unconscious mind. We're actually trying to make a little bit of a difference through education, through knowledge. Knowledge is, is everything. And it's quite interesting to chat to the guys that have come along that they're unaware of breathing exercises, the 7-Eleven breathing, the 7-Eleven breathing which can take down anxiety straight away. Just like in the old days, blowing in and out of uh, an old paper bag. Well, now, you know, we use these days, you can do 7-Eleven breathing without anyone knowing. You can be in Sainsbury's in the queue. You could start to feel that anxiety come on and the 7-Eleven breathing breathing in for 7 and long slow out breath for 11 and then that takes the panic and the anxiety straight away so it'd be lovely to see more people yeah lots of support and you know it's a great group down here so if anyone is interested it's Wednesday from 4 o'clock at the Helston Rugby Club so come down and uh, enjoy the group it'd be lovely to see anybody so we've got teas coffees biscuits as well and you don't have to partake you don't have to feel that you have to talk you can just sit there in silence and just take in from everybody else and if you want to contribute then you can it's a very caring safe and supportive environment a space to speak your mind it's a space to speak your mind and we're joined by claire sanders who's the lift experience coordinator for cornwall mind good to have you on the show claire hello good to join you and you're involved in the Community Mental Health Transformation Project, which we've talked about on the show before. But for those who don't know, can you just remind us what it is? Yeah, sure. So the overall aim is really to deliver a, a sort of integrated model of mental health across Cornwall. So, you know, we're looking at how the NHS can be more responsive, more needs based and really kind of person centred. So what that actually means is looking at each individual person and what their needs might be. So it's a very kind of person centred recovery approach and how all the different organisations link in together. So, for example, Primary care, and what we mean by primary care is kind of, you know, your GP service. So what services can you kind of access from a mental health perspective kind of locally in your GP surgery? Then also kind of how the voluntary organisations and sectors in mental health can get involved as well. So kind of, you know, organisations like MIND, organisations like Pentreef. What needs might you have kind of more broadly across the local authority? So housing, adult social care, those kind of things. And then also for those who need a bit more support, you know, what clinical support might you need? So it's really about looking at all those different pathways and understanding what does an individual person need, what might be the best kind of approach or journey for them, and really kind of integrating all those different services together. This is a huge transformation project. You know, there's lots of cultural change, but it's something that everybody's really committed to and everyone's really excited about to make sure that services can be as efficient and effective for people moving forward. And this project has been going now for, is it nearly two years, I believe? Yep. So it's sort of, it's a three year sort of kickstart of the project. Obviously change takes time and, and those changes will kind of continue over the coming years. But yes, we're sort of in a phased approach of really kind of kickstarting these conversations, kickstarting these projects and MIND are working alongside the NHS really closely on that. So what's been happening in the last couple of months? Can you give us a little update on what's been going on? Yeah, so what the NHS have done is set up sort of different projects and different work streams, which we've been helping them with. So MIND's involvement really is to be the voice of lived experience in the projects. So we have a small panel of what we call experts by experience. So these are people who have lived experience of recovery from poor mental health. They may have used some of these services. And really, we want them to be the voice of change. So what have you experienced? What could have been better? How might the service have better kind of supported you? So we've got a small panel at the moment who are involved in a number of different projects. So it's very much kind of making sure that the service user, those people who actually use these services, are included in those conversations. And it is really great because it is those personal experiences that you're looking for and that you've been assessing over time. And you're looking now really for more people to take part, aren't you? We are, yeah. So, I mean, the different things that we'll be looking at is what's working, what's not working, what is the process, how do you engage with services, can you self-refer, what's the kind of pathway into those services, and how do you want to get involved? So, at the moment, there's a number of projects around different service areas. So, one of those is kind of like the eating disorder team. Another one is around complex emotional difficulties. So, that's things like personality disorders, community rehabilitation. So perhaps if you've been an inpatient, then what does your community support look like once you leave the hospital? What are the digital tools, ways in which you can access services? 
How is that service communicated? Where do you find out that information? So there's lots of different projects all focusing on these different areas. What we're going to be looking for is to increase our panel of experts by experience. So an expert by experience, again, is somebody who has lived experience of recovery from poor mental health, or you could be a carer looking after somebody who has some mental health challenges. Really, it's about giving your feedback and insight to kind of help shape the design and delivery of these new pathways. So it's really an exciting chance to make an impact using your own lived experience. So there's lots of different ways you can get involved. At kind of the lowest level, you could be asked just for your opinion. So it could be reviewing a document, reviewing a website, looking at some proposals of how that things might change and kind of giving your opinion on that. At the kind of highest level, you might be on a project work stream whereby there's regular meetings with people like psychiatrists, psychologists, nurses, managers, lots of different people from the NHS. And you would be part of that conversation and using your experiences to inform and shape that and help those practitioners to understand, you know, how things could be better for people experiencing mental health difficulties. So it's very much about volunteering your time to get involved. There's no kind of minimum or maximum time commitment. So lots of people are doing this around other things you know they might be working or looking for work and they would like to get involved you will be remunerated for your time so if you do attend any meetings or take part in any focus groups for example or review any documents we do remunerate you for your time and pay any travel expenses some of these meetings take place online on teams or on zoom others might be like a face-to-face focus group for example so to make sure we have the maximum impact we're looking to do a call out for more participants to get involved in the coming months. So we're creating a bit of a mailing list, a bit of a newsletter to keep everyone updated and let people know what opportunities are coming up. So if that's something that is of interest to you, you can drop me an email. My email is Claire, C-L-A-I-R-E, Claire at cornwallmind.org. And I know that will be added into the notes for the show. So drop an email with your name and your email address, and we will add you to our mailing list and let you know what opportunities are coming up. That's great. And as you say, we will put those notes on the podcast. So if you are listening to the radio show at the moment, have a listen to the podcast, A Space to Speak Your Mind, which is available on all platforms. And then you can email Claire and take part. And what's the criteria for people that you're looking for? So, as I said, it's people who have recovery from poor mental health. You may have used some of those services, obviously, and this is limited to Cornwall. So we are looking for participants that live and work in Cornwall because this is very much focused on the Cornwall NHS. So you need to be local to Cornwall. That's Claire Sanders, who's the Lived Experience Coordinator for Cornwall Mind. Thank you so much for giving us the update today. Thank you. A space to speak your mind. Autism Awareness Month is running throughout April following Autism Acceptance Week and a new report has been released surrounding the barriers preventing autistic talents from entering the workplace. It comes as just 22% of UK autistic adults are currently employed. I'm joined by Mitzak Tarija, who's the Chief People and Social Innovation Officer for the Autocon Group. Good to have you on the show, Mita. Great to be here, Richard. Thanks for speaking to me. So what else did this research show? Well, this is a really interesting piece of research that we commissioned. What we wanted to really see was not just what are the experiences of autistic people in the workplace today, but also what their life journeys have been about, what are the things that they have come up against, and what are the challenges that they've really gone past to make great careers for themselves. So I think the key thing that we wanted to see through this research are what are the barriers that come up for autistic people in the workplace and where really the opportunities are for organizations to improve, to make the small changes that bring the big impact. So one of the things that we found, Richard, was the fact that right from the start, from finding the right career opportunity, finding the right job for them, to the interview process, to the entire recruitment process, actually acts as the biggest barrier for autistic people to get into work. Once they're into work, what happens next? is a different story altogether. But this did not come to us as a surprise because we hear of these stories day in, day out from our autistic colleagues who've been in employment before 
or have basically just struggled to get into employment before. So the research really just proves some of the trends that we've seen with our autistic colleagues. And as you may know, this is something that we've gone beyond national boundaries. We've spoken to about 1,000 people across eight countries. So this really goes beyond cultural and geographic boundaries and highlights some real common themes of challenges that autistic people face in the workplace. So what are those main barriers and particularly around recruitment for autistic adults in the workplace? Well, when asked about recruitment, most people talked about at least a third of them said that the recruitment process has been the most challenging aspect of their career. And of course, then a third of them said that settling into an organization was the second most challenging thing that they found in their working lives. And I think overall, the trend that we see, Richard, is that our employment ecosystem, it is not set up for the success of neurodivergent people. It is an ecosystem that places extraordinary emphasis on standardization. And that excludes a vast majority of autistic people. If you know, if you and I, you know, we've gone through our traditional recruitment processes, we know that these processes are based on, or the entire interactions, I must say, are based on unwritten rules, getting the unsaid messages in a job advert as an example, making eye contact during an interview, how well do you pick up on social cues, and really how do you sell yourself? Now, these are things that we know that most autistic people aren't going to do. So you've really excluded them from the opportunity to even have a job right from the start, just because most organizations are so set in their ways in terms of standardized recruitment processes. So what can employers do to help those with autism, particularly in the recruitment process? Well, in the recruitment process, it starts really, Richard, with people starting to look at how they're communicating their job opportunities. So a large number of autistic people said that they find it difficult to even look for jobs. They don't know what jobs might be suitable for them. And that really comes down to how jobs are advertised. It needs to really start from there, from companies looking at what the job roles talk about, how they talk about, and then, of course, inviting people, you know, creating this safe space for people to be able to say right from the start, listen, I might need some reasonable adjustments or I might want to speak to somebody over the phone or whatever the specific requirements or accommodations for an autistic person might be. And I guess it starts really from there right until people get into walk into an interview room to what are the things that you're testing for? Are you looking for opportunities, like we know, a lot of interviews are set up to be stress interviews to see how people respond to pressure. But now we know there's enough research and evidence that it's not just for autistic people, but for all of us, we respond better to a positive psychological basis of a conversation, which is talking about, you know, what are your strengths and not even just telling you what your strengths are, but really testing for something that allows a person to fully talk about and to fully display what they bring to the table yeah it's making it into a positive experience and you're right I mean, you know for all of us it, it can be such a, a daunting prospect having to go into one of those interviews so for those with challenging circumstances it, it must just be such a, a much more difficult situation and once that process has happened and just thinking generally in, in the workplace for also employees the other employees what can they do to make life more comfortable are the things that they particularly need to be aware of as well Well, Richard, to begin with, I think we all need to challenge what our preconceived ideas and our biases are about autism. It is uh, still in a large part of society is seen as a disability, and that really perpetuates the idea that autistic people are less capable. So I think the, the good starting point for everyone is to make an effort to find out a little bit more. And really, the way we see it at Autocon is that it's a battle of hearts and minds of people challenging themselves every day to see how much can we expand our capacities mentally and how much can we expand our hearts to see something different from us as not less, but a valuable human variation, something valuable that adds to the richness of all our experiences. So there's this beautifully explained line, one of our autistic colleagues said this, and this is, you know, you'll find this as a tagline in a lot of our emails at Autocon. They said it very beautifully that autism is not a processing error. 
It is a different operating system. So I think because autism has been so vastly misunderstood in the past, a good starting point for people is to improve their own awareness and understanding. And I think organizations can play a huge role in helping employees, in helping generate that awareness amongst their employees. And of course, it starts with there are systemic things, there are organizational things that can be done, like building inclusive practices, encouraging open dialogue, etc. But also, you know, how do we build our support and resource ecosystem in an organization? So one is, of course, things, equipment that employees can be helped with. But more importantly, how people are equipping themselves. If you are a manager, are you prepared tomorrow if one of your colleagues came up to you and disclose that they are autistic do you know how to respond would you know how best to support them one of the things that our research shows is that the majority of the people who do disclose their autism at work they disclose it either to a manager or to a trusted colleague and very few actually go into hr or a, any specialist group within the organization so the real question is how are we as people equipping ourselves to support those who might not have disclosed and those of course who have disclosed so really it is bringing an inclusive environment so there are many things that a workplace can do to make someone that has autism into the work environment in a much more positive way Yes, Richard, and it's important to involve a range of ideas. And we know, you know, diversity is so talked about these days. We also want to make sure as an organization, you want to make sure that you are including all voices, including neurodivergent voices in everything that you do. And there is often, of course, there have been a lot of advocacy for autistic people, but we as an organization, as an example, we really encourage self-advocacy. A lot of autistic people might not do that. So you have to look at active practices to include their voices in everything. This very famous line, nothing about us without us. So I would encourage organizations to think about what they can do to actively involve people, even when designing solutions for how autism or neurodivergent people can be supported better in the workplace. I'm actually very proud to say that that's something that we actively do at Autocon. We are a majority autistic company. Over 80% of our workforce is neuro neurodivergent. And actually, I'm I'm quite proud to report that our first ever neurodiversity at work report has been guest edited by one of our autistic colleagues, Louise Stone, who's the head of recruitment and community partnerships for Autocon US. And she herself is a vocal champion for autism. So I think this diverse representation of voices is very important to make sure that whatever you are designing for autistic people has an input from them, designed for them, by them. So where can we find out more for Autism Awareness Month? Well, Richard, we have our report, so the Autcon Impact Report and our Neurodiversity at Work survey will be available on our website, autocon.com. And of course, we also have a podcast that you can find on Spotify, YouTube and Google. It's called Autism in conversation with Autocon, and it's a podcast series we've been running for almost two years now, which is hosted by Carrie Grant, and it features interviews with leading voices on autism, people from the business world and vocal social media influencers. And really what we want to drive with this podcast is more awareness so people understand the realities of an autistic person's life and also to demystify neurodiversity as a whole. We'll put the notes for that podcast as well in the show notes for our podcast, so they'll be able to hear more. For now, Mita Tarija, who's the Chief People and Social Innovation Officer at Autocon Group, thank you so much for talking with us. Pleasure, Richard. Thank you. A space to speak your mind with Cornwall Mind. Hey, it's a space to speak your mind. I'm joined once again by Rob from Cornwall Mind, and we're talking about the Hope Walks, which take place at Trillisic, just outside Truro. So, Rob, good to have you back on the show. Thanks for letting me come, Richard. Can you explain what exactly the Hope Walk is? Hope Walks is a free walking group for people who have been affected by the loss of someone close to them who may have died by suicide. People have got a calm or relaxed environment to talk about what's happened to them. The idea is that they've got peer support and they can share ideas and share their experiences with people who get what they've been through. So how can people benefit from taking part in these Hope Walks? 
People who have been bereaved in this way often feel isolated. They often feel that family members or friends don't really understand what they've been through. So if they come along to a Hope Walk, they can talk to people who do get them, who have been through that same experience. And so, yeah, by sharing things, they can give each other support and give that opportunity to be able to sort of articulate their feelings that they haven't been able to or haven't felt safe to up until now. We've had people who have come along on the walk and they said this is the first time I've talked about my brother or the person they've lost. It's the first time they've spoken to about that person in a long time. It's a great way really, isn't it, to be social and there's no real pressure for talking. It's really just having that experience of being outside, being with other people and opening up the conversation. Yeah, there's no pressure on people at all. The main thing is that they come along and uh, yeah, it's just like uh, Trelissic is a beautiful environment, beautiful grounds. Just being out in nature is really calming for people and really good for their mental health anyway. So um, yeah, just being outside, being hopefully in the sunshine and uh, just hoping that that will allow people to feel more relaxed and, and talk. Are there other locations that you're going to be at as well? We've already started one at Lanhydrock and uh, that's a, a, another beautiful venue. Uh, I'm going to be doing another walk in the evening at Trelissic so that if people work they'll be able to come to the evening session. I'm also going to be setting up one in Helston, so Penrose area, Penrose estate, and we'll be setting up one in the autumn in Newquay, so walking along the by the Gannel. So all of those locations are really nice areas, the best of Cornish scenery. And it's really for anyone so there's no age, no particular demographic at all? There's no demographic, no. Um, we welcome everybody. The Hope Walks are for anyone who has been bereaved in this way, anyone who has lost someone who has died by suicide. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's a family member or a friend, a partner, and it doesn't matter also about a time limit. So if it could be like a, a recent bereavement or it could be that someone who's lost someone in you know 10 years ago or 20 years ago, we appreciate that everyone takes time to talk about these things. So anyone is welcome. And bereavement is such a difficult subject, so... Having that open space is really a positive way of opening up the dialogue and having people feel comfortable about talking about bereavement. I think that's the key thing. Um, When I first started doing this job, I was very reluctant to talk about it myself. And uh, I appreciate that what people said to me was that it was better to talk about it and perhaps people would get emotional, people would get upset, but it was better for that to happen than for people not to mention things at all. And so what I think is really important about this is, is like you said, opening up that dialogue people just being in a, in a safe space to talk about things. Suicide is society's problem, it's everybody's problem and I think we all need to be able to talk about it and also the position where we can support people who've been bereaved in this way um, so that they don't feel so isolated at this difficult time. And how can someone get involved if they'd like to come along? The direct way is um, you can email me, so it's rob at cornwallmind.org or you can get in touch via the Cornwall Mind website. This is a space to speak your mind. And at the start of the month, I caught up with Alice, who's running the whole of the UK mainland coastline to raise money for Mind and the British Heart Foundation at the Penrose Park Run in Helston. A space to speak your mind with Cornwall Mind. I'm here and I'm joined by Alice and you've just done a 5k for Mind. Tell me what that was like. It was great. A real buzz. Park runs are so nice. It just it gets you out on a Saturday morning, sets the weekend off right. It's such an inclusive thing to do as well. I mean, you've got the park walkers now. No one's ever left out. Your dogs, your children, it's great. I think it's wonderful. And you're doing this as part of quite a feat. Tell me about what the whole process is going to be. You're running for quite a few months. Yeah, so I'm running the coast of mainland Britain for Mind and BHF, the British Heart Foundation. I'm hoping... It'll take me about 300 days. Hopefully it'll be about 5,000 miles all the way around. So yeah, I'm on day 112 and I've just done my, I think maybe my 7th or 8th park run on the way around. And you've not finished for today either, have you? No, I'm doing another 12 kilometres. This is a rest day for me. (laughs) And what was the reason for doing this? My father passed away when I was 18 from a heart condition. It was very sudden. I struggled a lot after it happened. That sort of didn't feel like real life. It didn't feel quite like reality. So I wasn't very well mentally for quite a long time, um, especially because I was in the middle of my degree. So there was quite a lot to process and I did fumble my way through it. So I'm trying to sort of raise awareness for sudden death, heart conditions, mental health, just how to sort of cope with grief and loss. And you're going to be doing this for, as we say, the next couple of hundred days. So where did you start and where do you think you'll end up? 
So I started from my home in Fife, South Fife, and I will finish in my home in South Fife. And what's the one you're most looking forward to? Is there a park run? Is there a particular part of the country you want to do a run? That's a really good question. I've never done much of Britain before this. I think the furthest south I'd ever been was Shropshire, furthest north probably Inverness. So every day is unexpected. I don't know what I'm going to find. So there's no particular point that I'm excited for. It's all surpassing my expectations. And you're raising money as well. So if people want to support you, is there a website? Have you got an Instagram or Facebook for the charities? Yes. So I have two social medias, my Strava and my Instagram, which is alice.r.connolly. I have a Just Giving page and the links to that are on both my social medias. And you can find the Just Giving if you just look up British Coastal Run. We'll we'll link those to the podcast as well, so if people are inspired by what you're doing, they can donate there. But thank you so much for joining us and enjoy the rest of your rooms. Thank you very, very much. A space to speak your mind with Cornwall Mind. Now it's time to find out what's happening at Cornwall Mind this month. Hi, I'm Jo from Cornwall Mind. Really exciting news. We've just made our referral system a little bit easier. We're currently taking referrals for all of our wellbeing services, which includes a wide range of wellbeing groups, workshops and programmes. So if you fancy something like gardening and being outdoors, maybe something online, we offer a really good creative writing workshop and an online social cafe. Maybe you're into music or art or walking. And we also have a brilliant radio show workshop. We also have support for those bereaved by suicide, Hope Walks, which is a walking group. So how do you get involved? Well, we've just made it a whole lot easier. So just visit our website. On an every page in the top right-hand corner, you'll find a referral form to download. Just fill it in. It's really simple. It's really easy. Send it back to us and our wellbeing navigator will be in touch. So visit our website, which is cornwallmind.org. And we've got a page that says what we do. And you'll find lots of information and more details about our groups, workshops and programmes. And follow us on social media at Cornwall Mind. We're on Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. You can find out about all our new groups and launches. And hopefully we'll be in a town near you soon. We are expanding our wellbeing groups and services. So hopefully we'll be reaching a lot more areas in Cornwall over the coming months. And don't forget, we have seven community cafes running in Cornwall at the moment. We're in Newquay, St. Austell, Truro, Falmouth, Liscard, Lou and Camborne. And the dates and venues are on our What's On calendar on our website, cornwallmind.org. If you missed anything on today's show, you can download the podcast right now on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify and now Amazon Podcasts and tune in. For more support and more information for better mental health, visit cornwallmind.org or call the Mind Helpline during office hours on 0300 123 3393. There is a new 24-7 local urgent mental health response phone line. It's free to access by anyone, any age on 0800 038 5300. And call the Samaritans anytime for free on 116 123. If you'd like to be a part of the show, you can get in contact. Just email a space to speak your mind at gmail.com. Or you can also follow us on Twitter or like us on Facebook. That's all for this month. I'm Richard. Have a great April and join me next time on A Space to Speak Your Mind. A Space to Speak Your Mind with Cornwall Mind for better mental health.